There are a lot of ways to play through Fallout 3 and Fallout New Vegas. Many different self-imposed challenges you could try your hand at to make the games harder to complete. But even then, you'll still be focused entirely on that one game. But what if you had to play them both simultaneously? Can you beat Fallout 3 and Fallout New Vegas at the same time? The short and sweet version of how this works is as follows. Get two computers and a PlayStation 4 controller. Connect the controller to computer A via Bluetooth, then to computer B via the controller's cable. Launch whatever games you want to play, and if all goes well, you'll be able to control both games at the same time with one controller. I thought for a while about different ways to capture the footage after I'd gotten this idea to work properly. But in the end, I decided on arguably the worst way. A camera pointed at both screens. I wanted to show both screens at the same time as proof that I controlled them both. Using something like OBS to capture the gameplay on both computers, as well as a dedicated camera pointed at both monitors, would have been pretty convoluted. And for the last few months, I've been using an Elgato capture card to record all my PC-based challenges after having framerate issues with OBS. Also, fun fact, one of my computers is an iMac that I bought in August 2018, and I still have the protective plastic that came around the thing wrapped around the computer. I hope that annoys you as much as it doesn't annoy me. Once I got everything working as intended, I began the challenge. I got this idea from seeing Pikaspri Yellow play Pokemon Sapphire and Ruby at the same time. But this is completely different from that. For all intents and purposes, those games are the same. You go to the same towns, battle the same gym leaders. There are just a few differences between them. But Fallout 3 and New Vegas are not the same game, which is where the challenge comes from. The builds for each character were based around one thing, speed. I wanted to get through the games as quickly as possible. New Vegas is built around the speech skill, as is Fallout 3 to a lesser extent. The ideal scenario for both games is to be in dialogue in one and outside of dialogue in the other. Normally, I skip through all dialogue as quickly as I can, but staying in it in one game buys you valuable time to orientate yourself to the direction you need to go. Directions are an issue more so than I would have thought, because the sensitivity is different between games. New Vegas is running on a computer without any mods installed. As such, it runs shockingly poorly for a $1,700 gaming laptop. I got out into the wasteland in New Vegas around the time of my 10th birthday in Fallout 3. I was locked in place in Vault 101, so I used that time to quickly barter with Chet inside the Good Springs General Store to acquire a few useful items and begin making my way to the Strip. Another annoying issue is when the games become unsynced, when opening your Pip-Boy in one game closes it in the other. I discovered fairly quickly that you talking to an NPC gives you the chance to close the Pip-Boy in one game to get things back in line. Luckily, X is the activate button. If you're not currently looking at someone or any lootable object, pressing X whenever you want does nothing. The other thing you want to do, as I've already mentioned, is take advantage of dialogue whenever possible. If you're going to need to look to the left in both New Vegas and 3, you might want to look to the right in New Vegas, talk to an NPC in 3, so that when you close the dialogue interface, you can turn to the left in both games to face the direction you want to go. Having a solid understanding of what you're going to be doing in both games is almost essential in a run like this. Once I killed the bug in Fallout 3, I posed for the picture, advanced several years, and filled out my goat answer sheet, picking medicine, speech, and barter as my skills. Choosing barter was a mistake on par with God making me, but we'll get to that later. At the same time, I continued towards Sloan in New Vegas, killed several geckos, and discovered Hidden Valley, so I could fast travel there later to quickly deal with the Brotherhood of Steel portion of New Vegas' main quest. I left Butch's mother to get mauled to death by the roaches after failing to convince him to go help her and continued making my way out of the vault. My strength in Fallout 3 was high enough that I could knock out one of the vault guards before pulling out a handgun and knocking out the overseer with a bullet. I made sure I had something that wasn't a gun equipped in New Vegas. Didn't want to waste ammo in one game while in combat in the other. The area around Hidden Valley was large and open, so I didn't have to worry too much about running into anything deadly. I made sure to snag some extra ammo before opening the Overseer's Tunnel, escaping, and beginning to make my way through something I've been dreading. Quarry Junction, 
or at least the outskirts of it. Death claws are there, and they're always a threat. To be honest, dying in one game isn't the end of the world. I would lose some progress, because I couldn't spam quick saves every 11 seconds like I usually do, but even in a worst case scenario, I could let myself die over and over again in one game while I dealt with the situation in the other. Outside of Vault 101, I was into the wasteland, and the real game begins. Also, something I need to point out, I used an iPad to record this whole thing. I could see what the tablet was recording as I played, and I tried my best to get the best possible view of both games as I could, but it didn't always work out perfectly, despite me using the highest quality camera at my disposal. Getting through the Deathclaw infested portion of the map was surprisingly not super difficult, probably because I've literally done it with my feet before. From there, I spent what felt like decades navigating my way through the world of Fallout 3 on my way to Megaton. Inside, I sold a few things to Moira, headed to Camp McCarran in New Vegas to kill an NCR trooper for their armor, and because it wouldn't be a Mitten Squad video without some sort of disastrous bitch slap from God, I discovered a problem in Fallout 3 that's plagued me before. For some reason, my pit boy stops working after talking to anyone in Megaton. Stops working is kind of a lie disappears. Of course, I took the manly approach to this problem. I would allow myself to use a console command to give me back the Pip-Boy, but only after I got to Smith Casey's garage. A good dog knows that they must work for their treat. To get the NCR Trooper armor, I played a game of chance with the gods of Fallout. I had a 95% chance to hit the Trooper and a 9% chance to hit Walter. God loves him some Walter, and Walter lived to see another day. Then Fallout 3 crashed. In that instance, I would simply pause the other game, boot Fallout 3 back to the main menu, and press continue to get both games back into the gameplay part of the game that you play. I reloaded an older save in Fallout 3 to try to fix the Pip-Boy issue. I don't think it would surprise you to know that it didn't. So, for the time being, it's also a Fallout 3 without a Pip-Boy run. The only silver lining was that I had a 10mm pistol equipped and plenty of ammo. But, to my dismay, I could not mark on the map where Smith Casey's garage was located. I'm gonna explain more about this sentence after I'm finished, but I want you to know that the next 33 minutes were spent trying to get to Camp McCarran in New Vegas and Smith Casey's garage in Fallout 3. My inability to know where I was going amazed even me. Even in New Vegas, I had a bugger of a time trying to get anywhere near McCarran. There were a handful of moments throughout Paul's great journey to nowhere where I let myself walk into a wall in one game to make progress in the other. I probably said this already, but that was something I wanted to avoid doing, unless absolutely necessary. It almost defeats the entire purpose of this challenge. I put much more effort into trying to get to the garage than I did trying to get to the NCR base, only because I had no way to heal myself in Fallout 3. Any damage I take is temporarily permanent until I get my Pip-Boy back. Upon leveling up in New Vegas, I dumped all the points into speech as expected, and the adventure continued to go south. Literally, I was going south in both games. As interesting as this isn't, I'm not going to waste too much more time on wandering towards various locations. Nothing of note happened. I reached the southern border of the map in Fallout 3, shot a bee for not thinking B, finally got to Camp McCarran in New Vegas, got killed by a death claw in Fallout 3, entered the NCR monorail station, failed terribly at keeping the camera properly focused, and had a glimmer of hope as I saw Tenpenny Tower. I knew for a fact that I could use that as a lighthouse of sorts and cast myself deeper out to sea until I drowned in my own disappointment. It was there I decided I'd been a big boy for long enough. It was time to get my pit boy back. I might not have been at Smith Casey's garage yet, and I wasn't almost there either, but I was almost almost there, and that was enough for me. With the map back in front of my eyes, I could mark the garage on my map, heal myself up a bit, and try to get onto the strip in New Vegas to settle an old score. It was around the time I came face to face with a feral ghoul reaver in Fallout 3 that I realized someone had put shit in my pants. It was almost dead, so it wasn't much of a threat. Victor ran his mouth for a while, and I let him talk as much as he wanted to use that instance of dialogue to make some solid progress in Fallout 3 but I could put it off no longer. I pulled out my grenade launcher, adjusted the camera a bit, and entered the tops to find Benny. As I did earlier, 
I made sure to remove any weapon from the lone wanderer's hand so I didn't waste any ammo while I died in the casino. That spike thing you see in his left hand is the pit boy. Soon after I died, I made one of the worst discoveries of my life. I'd been playing New Vegas on easy instead of very easy. That mistake no doubt costed me quite a bit of progress. The grenade launcher, as always, made quick work of Benny and the chairman inside the casino, but I didn't rely on it exclusively. I kept a few grenades in my wallet just in case I needed them down the road. With Benny dead and the platinum chip in my possession, I leveled up several times, dumping the points into speech every time, and headed upstairs to Benny's room to speak to Yes Man. He had a lot to say. While he rambled on about plans and chips and houses, I ventured south or west of her towards the garage, got inside, killed the mole rats, got the Vault 112 jumpsuit, and entered the simulation to save my father. At the same time, my campaign of carnage on the strip continued inside the Ultra Lux. I got so distracted with all the dead people inside the casino that I might have accidentally beaten my father into unconsciousness. I'll tell you now that I made a mistake in the Ultra Lux by not killing every named NPC. I'd have to go back there later, even if I didn't know it at that moment. My next objective was Mr. House and the failsafe in the abandoned Tranquility Lane house. Mr. House, showing the upgrade to his Securitrons, presented me with the perfect opportunity to activate the failsafe in Vault 112, spawn in the people with the fancy hats, rescue my father, and begin the daunting task of getting to Rivet City. Normally, if I was only interested in beating the game by any means necessary, I'd go straight to Little Lamplight and glitch myself into Vault 87 early. But with a controller instead of a keyboard, I lacked the ability to abuse the quick save feature to clip myself through the wall, meaning that skipping that part of the game wasn't an option. My only option was Rivet City. I went ahead and killed Mr. House while I was in the Lucky 38. I'd be siding with Yes Man, so there was no scenario in which Robert would be allowed to live. From there, I fast traveled back to Vault 101 in Fallout 3 to head towards Rivet City and got to work meeting the various Mojave factions to progress the wildcard quest line. That meant doing to the Omerta thugs what I did to the lads at the tops. They died a lot. From there, the order in which I met the Boomers, Brotherhood of Steel, and Great Khans didn't matter much, so I started with the Boomers. The path to Nellis is pretty much a straight shot. You can encounter some feral cows if you're not careful, but it's mostly empty space. Here I learned myself a neat little trick that would benefit my sanity on a handful of occasions. Because the sensitivities between games are not identical, I can spin myself around in both games at different rates, which means I can use that to spin me right round like a record and, if I stop at the right time, be pointed in the direction I need to go in both games. As usual, I somehow found myself in Grey Ditch, the town filled to the brim with giant ants and annoying children fleeing for their lives. I locked myself in a corner for the moment to get past the boomer bombardment. If any situation called for that tactic, it's this one. Raquel led me to Pearl while I ignored the witch living in the shack on the river and discovered the citadel. With the boomers taken care of, I crossed the sea, ignored all the unfriendliness at the Jefferson Memorial, discovered Rivet City, and the game crashed. That set me back quite a bit. I was back in front of the Jefferson Memorial. I got back in front of Rivet City after taking more damage from a big green bully than I did the first time around. Entered Rivet City, made my way to the science lab, and let Dr. Zipper talk about his crazy ideas about robotic people while I inched closer and closer to 188 Trading Post. Veronica is there and makes stealing with the Brotherhood of Steel a cakewalk. With Veronica as a companion, I spoke to Dad about Project Purity, entered the Bunker of Destiny, bartered with Shrapnel, left Rivet City, and headed towards the Jefferson Memorial to clear it of mutants. At the same time, I got to know the Elder of the Brotherhood of Steel to take care of that part of Yes Man's quest. The mutants inside the Jefferson Memorial were not fun to contend with. I'd willfully neglected my small gun skill like I do with all my adult responsibilities, like paying rent or getting groceries. The upside is that I timed it rather well. I didn't have to be careful about not attacking anyone in New Vegas because I was still in a dialogue menu. The only way out of dialogue is to pause the game, which only pauses dialogue, who'd have guessed that, or to manually end the conversation. Pressing B to bring up your pit boy won't do it. With the monsters escorted to the big farm in the sky, where they'll live forever in agony, I left both indoor spaces, 
let Dad know it was safe to enter the memorial, got to work making repairs on various components down in the basement, and traveling out to Red Rock Canyon to meet the Great Khans. There are dangers lurking in those mountains. Geckos are quick and pack a mean punch with their mouth. Fiends can attack from a distance, and Cazadors are enough to make God cry. Deathclaws can be found nearby too, but they're across the road in the hills. Hug the cliffs, and you should be able to get to Red Rock Canyon without too many issues. I couldn't make up my mind about which objective I wanted to focus on, making repairs in Fallout 3, or meeting the Great Cons in New Vegas. So I just sort of meandered around for a bit, making no progress in either game. An error in judgment went in one ear and out the other as I entered Papa Khan's special cool kids clubhouse. You see, the NCR massacred the Great Khans at Bitter Springs, and I just so happened to have forgotten to take off my NCR armor. Yeah, they were not too thrilled to see me. Once the armor was removed, I let Papa Khan talk for a while while I finished up repairs for Dad and went out to play in the toxic sewage just as Dad asked me to. He said it was to fix a pipe, but I always color outside the lines, so I knew what he was really saying. By the time I got to the pipe, the Enclave arrived on the scene in the cover of darkness, and I'd gone back to tell Yes Man that his throne was ready for him. Now the Enclave are tough sons of Their power armor does its job of protecting them from small arms fire. That's good for them, and horrible for me. It could take three, four, or even five shots to down one Enclave soldier. In a one-on-one -on -one fight, that's annoying. When there are multiple soldiers attacking at once, it's a veritable death sentence. Or it would be if I wasn't the playable character. Back in the rotunda, Dad's lungs filled with invisible radiation, which suffocated him from the inside out. New Vegas crashed for the first time, and I made my way back to the Ultra Lux to kill one person in particular. I'm not entirely sure what was going through my mind at that moment. I shot someone, left, then went back to the Lucky 38. I ended up having to go back to the Ultra Lux a third time to finish off Chauncey while dealing with the additional Enclave soldiers that arrived while Dad died. They were just as difficult to kill as the first wave I faced earlier. With all of them dead, I took to the tunnels with Madison Lee and all the other Nimrods to escape to the Citadel. Another mistake was made down there by yours truly. To keep things simple, I'll just say that I left all of them in the dust to fend for themselves while I looked out for number one. I'd hoped that I could make it to the Citadel, wait for a few hours, and she'd show up. That did not happen, as I took the final steps towards the point of no return in New Vegas by going out to the El Diablo submarine sandwich shop to reroute some power. I had to backtrack through the ghoul-infested tunnels to find Madison Lee. She decided to care about another person for the first time in her wretched existence that she calls a life, and tell me that she'd go no further without helping Garza. I convinced her to let him die, and she went back to find him. I followed her and complained the entire time. I stopped for a second to get some stim packs from the medicine room, and all the scientists were gone. For no other reason than to torment myself some more, I returned to the surface. As I prepared to go back into the tunnels for the third time, she reared her stupid face, got us inside the citadel, I spoke to Elder Lions, and in a moment of panic, I reloaded a save. I'd forgotten to pick the Child at Heart perk to make getting inside Little Lamplight idiot-proof. But the plan to make a new plan was not idiot-proof. I couldn't take the Child at Heart perk because it requires charisma of 4, so all that did was waste time. As I got closer to the station in New Vegas, I realized that unless drastic measures were taken, I'd beat New Vegas long before I beat Fallout 3. In the small part of my brain that was still functioning as it was advertised on the box it came in, an idea began to take form. The NCR didn't disturb me while I activated the thing, mostly because of my NCR armor that had long ago began crumbling around my fragile frame. I stuck around the station for a few moments while I got information about Vault 87 from a terminal and Scribe Rothschild. Before heading out to the land of unkillable children, I stopped by Megaton to purchase supplies for the road. I didn't have much to barter with, and as such, couldn't buy much either. It didn't take too long for me to get to Little Lamplight. McCready let me inside, I asked him to open the gate to Murder Pass, and I killed time in New Vegas. Yes Man informed me that the time had come for the second battle of Hoover Dam, and I put the battle for the fate of the Mojave Wasteland on hold to tie up a few loose ends in Good Springs. Beginning the Ghost Town gunfight quest this late in the game felt odd, and at long last, 
I entered the reactor chamber of Vault 87. I didn't have enough ammo to take on the super mutants living in the vault, so I ignored them all as I ran deeper into the vault. Fox would save me once I released him from his cage. As I've done all along, I let Trudy talk her head off to buy me some valuable time. With New Vegas effectively on hold, skedaddling my way through Vault 87 was possibly the easiest part of this challenge so far. Problem was, I usually relied on a little trick where I spam quick save quick load as soon as I enter the testing labs to keep the mutants from following me inside. That wasn't really an option this time. I had high hopes for the two grenades I threw into the crowd. They were quite disappointing, but I visit the Mitten Squad Discord server often enough to be accustomed to disappointment. I released Fox, ran for my life from every mutant in the vault, restored some health from Fox's sink, and he died. I bet he enjoyed his 11 seconds of freedom. I used the same ignore everything tactic as I pressed deeper into the vault towards the Gek. I only had one rat away and no rat X. I had to perform at a level no Mitten Squad ever has before. And by God Howard, I did it. I got the Gek. Didn't die, ate all the lead the mutants threw at me, got abducted by the Enclave, and spoke to Ringo about handling the situation with the Powder Gangers. Sunny Smiles was just as excited to die as I was, and her death was enough to satisfy me. So I didn't bother recruiting Trudy, Easy Pete, or anyone else to join in the fun. Being level 9 or 10 or whatever I am now, taking on the Powder Gangers wasn't even close to a challenge. After retrieving my most prized possessions from the locker, I ran as fast as my legs would let me through the Enclave base to meet the president. I returned to the strip in New Vegas and struggled to remember where I left Veronica. I didn't bother finding her. She'd teleport to my side when Yes Man dragged me to the dam. Fallout 3 crashed again. I escaped the Enclave base, returned to the Citadel, and the end began. Both the battles for the fate of the Mojave Wasteland and the Capital Wasteland unfolded at the same time. The monotony of following behind Liberty Prime nearly killed me. Right before it did, something else got me while I was preoccupied with installing Yes Man in the Hoover Dam control box. Surprisingly, neither of the final quests gave me all that much trouble. The small corridor in the Hoover Dam offices doesn't play nicely with the bridge you're on while you follow behind Liberty Prime. It's easy to accidentally fall off and die or lose some progress. But if you use loading screens to your advantage, you can position yourself to be looking the way you're supposed to be in both games. I was grateful to Liberty Prime for doing his job flawlessly for once. He didn't glitch out, he didn't stop along the path to the Jefferson Memorial, none of the bridge or the road was gone. It went just about as smoothly as it could go. As for New Vegas, I didn't have much ammo for any weapon left. I had the 10mm pistol out because I had the most ammo for that, but that wasn't a lot. It hardly would have been enough to kill one Centurion. Soon enough, I found myself and Veronica at the Legates camp in New Vegas, and Sentinel Lions, Sticky and I, arrived at the Jefferson Memorial. In both games, I pretended the enemy forces didn't exist, and ran past them to end it all. No reason to fight if not fighting is an option. The Praetorians can be ignored, as can the Enclave soldiers in the Memorial. I'd built my characters in both games around speech to end the conflicts without any bloodshed. That worked well in New Vegas. I calmly dismantled the Legate's argument using logic and reason while failing to do the same thing to Colonel Autumn, so his complete and total annihilation was the only possible course of action. I could have reloaded a save to convince him to stand down, but a dead Colonel Autumn is worth more to me than an alive one. With the antagonist defeated, I sent Sarah Lyons into the purifier to take one for the team, instructed Yes Man to throw General Oliver off the Hoover Dam, and against all odds, I beat both Fallout 3 and Fallout New Vegas not only at the same time, but within 10 seconds of each other. If you enjoyed the video or learned anything, leave a like. Leave a dislike if you didn't enjoy the video or didn't learn anything. Thanks to the Champion Tier supporters as well as other channel members for making videos like this one possible. Join the Mitten Squad Discord server through a link in the video description. Follow me on Twitter at Mitten Squad. My name is Paul of Mitten Squad. Have a wonderful day.